that is inspired in part by Taiwan President Lai Ching-de's vision for whole of society resilience. And we are honored today to be partnering with the American Chamber of Commerce in Ukraine for an absolutely unprecedented session on whole of society resilience and business continuity. We all know that whole of society resilience is now front and center in Taiwan, and we believe there's no better place to go to gain insights on, on what this means than the business community in Ukraine. This group, including those folks you'll be hearing from today, has demonstrated unmatched courage, resilience, foresight, and they have navigated some of the most difficult circumstances that are imaginable. As we're looking to strengthen Taiwan's own anti-fragility, Ukraine's experience offers all of us profound lessons on how to thrive in the face of adversity. Amcham Ukraine and its members have persevered through extraordinary disruptions, and they have succeeded by placing careful attention on planning and responding to the needs of their stakeholders and their customers with agility. And it is a great privilege for us to have with us today Andy Hunder, who is the president of Amcham Ukraine. He will join us alongside top business leaders from multinational companies that are operating in Ukraine. And this will allow us to hear practical ideas for business continuity, sources of strength, and what it means to be a leader in a time of crisis. Andy Hunder has been a champion for Ukraine and has earned his place as a respected voice on Ukraine's resilience from Eastern Europe to Central Asia, to the entirety of the West and beyond. Andy is a British national. He has an extremely impressive career that spans leadership roles at Vodafone, GlaxoSmithKline, and the Ukrainian Institute in London. And since taking the helm at Ukraine, uh, Amcham Ukraine in 2015, he has been a tireless advocate for Ukraine's business community and an influential leader on the world stage. Amcham Ukraine ha was founded in 1992. Today it has over 600 members. Many of the names of company members would be familiar to all of us here in Taiwan. And like us here in Taiwan, it is regarded as the most influential foreign chamber in its market. Since gaining independence in 1991 after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Ukraine has faced numerous threats from the annexation of Crimea in 2014 to the full-scale invasion by Russia in February of 2022. Ukraine is Europe's second largest country by land area. It is the home to 41 million people and the fortitude of its citizens have been an inspiration to the entire world, including here in Taiwan, where we recognize the importance of uh, resilience in our own context. Amcham Taiwan is privileged to host this session today. We hope it provides an opportunity to our members to learn from Ukraine's business leaders. And we've also invited stakeholders from the broadest, broader community in Taiwan for the same purpose. Andy, we are thrilled and honored to have you with us today. We look forward to your insights. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dan, and a very good uh, well, welcome from Kiev. Very good morning from uh, from Kiev. Uh, we are delighted to do this together with our colleagues at Amcham uh, Taiwan. Uh, this is the family, a family of American chambers of commerce across the world, across the globe, and we are all united and supporting our members. And I think today we will have an opportunity to hear from um, some of our key members in terms of the resilience that they have seen their employees and really sharing the stories. Um, we are 966 days into this full scale invasion. Uh, we woke up in Kyiv on uh, February the 24th, uh, two and a half years ago, and the Russians were, were coming. They were coming towards Kyiv and um, the intelligence we had, the uh, contingency plans we had prepared, we had um, hibernation, relocation, evacuation plans. Uh, plans. Um, although uh, many still, um, we weren't sure what would happen. The US intelligence was clearly saying that um, the Russians would invade, um, but many were also saying that Kyiv would, would fall within three days. 
but we've seen due to this resilience, the phenomenal resilience of Ukraine, Ukrainians and the global support, uh, Kiev stands, Ukraine stands and business, business stands united with Ukraine. And I think today we really want to share some of our key learnings. More and more business schools are coming to us now asking how do you run an organization during a full scale war? And I think, you know, what we've seen is, is truly um, phenomenal. So Amcham, uh, as Dan said, we've been in Ukraine since 1992, 600 members. We do three things. Number one, the B2G, being the voice of business to government, working with the government closely here in Ukraine, uh, working with the government in the United States. Uh, secondly, B2B, bringing goods, a platform, bringing good companies together. And thirdly, what we do is what we call B2U, Business to Ukraine, really getting the message out about what's happening in Ukraine, what are the opportunities, what are some of the challenges of doing business in Ukraine to audiences um, outside the, um, the, 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 the country. So as we were preparing, what were our key contingency plans? So we, we bought paper maps. We took out paper money. Um, we uh, had jerry cans of fuel in the car every single evening. Um, but the paper maps, uh, we didn't, um, because the the great uh, preparedness of the, the companies, and I think we'll hear uh, shortly from um, uh, Microsoft in terms of how important it is to have the preparedness, uh, how important it is to have the cyber, uh, and the banks, the banks have continued to work uh, seamlessly. Why? Because um, it's really the the, the the liaisons and the contact with the uh, the government. So the, uh, the the national bank had the regulations in place. They moved the data centers very quickly. And if during this the World War Two, during the Second World War. The safest places for key infrastructure were down underground in the tunnels. Today, the safest place for key infrastructure is up in the cloud. And that's why that's one of the key reasons. So we have companies like Microsoft, like AWS, like Google, Cisco, IBM, and that's really allowed for the infrastructure, the mobile phone network, the Internet, uh, the banks to continue uh, working. And, you know, sometimes we do say that the Internet works better in, in wartime Kiev than it does in many cities across Europe. And that's because of the phenomenal work that we've seen of, of, of companies and um, who continue to work. So today, 85 percent of our members continue to work uh, uninterrupted. Uh, we have had uh, over 30 percent of members that have had uh, destruction or damage to uh, factories, to plants, to offices. Um, we have had 84% uh, of members have their employees serving in the armed forces uh, and continue to serve. So we've seen this real push supporting the, um, uh, the fight for freedom, for independence, for liberty. Um, you know, very sadly, 30% of our members have had at least one employee that has been killed over the last uh, two and a half years. And we see this resilience continues. So the, the, the war uh, continues, uh, the fight continues, but the resilience, the resilience um, continues. And I think it's really seen, you know, um, today we'll be able to share some of the key stories, uh, especially from companies like Microsoft, how they prepared how they've managed to keep um, the infrastructure up and running. I think we'll hear from McDonald's. McDonald's have served 67 million uh, customers from January uh, this year alone, the first nine months. How do they do that? Uh, from the Intercontinental, uh, the Intercontinental top hotel in Kiev, it didn't close for a single day. How they continued to uh, provide five-star service during a full-scale war, and Artem, the general manager, will be able to share that today. And I think these are real stories of um, uh, inspiration. So I think it's really, we wake up every morning and the number one question is, are all of my team alive? Are all of my team safe? And I think uh, during the first days of the full-scale war, that was the number one issue. So we had prepared, we had contingency plans, um, the most important thing was communication. 
So having a team, a very a tight team of the leadership, in our case, it was five people. We were in touch almost on an hourly basis. Uh, we had contingency plans, you know, what to do, how we would communicate if the mobile phone networks went down. Um, but we luckily, uh, again, thanks to the companies, that continued. So we had uh, the ability to communicate. And the most important thing was communicating with the staff. So we had daily calls, uh, daily calls on um, uh, Microsoft Teams, and it was so important to see faces. I think both the communications and the visuals were so important. And I think, you know, the key learnings during the war, I think President Zelensky, his forte was, you know, he was come of the hour, come of the man. I think his forte was communications, and he managed to communicate to the people, here in Ukraine, but also he managed to communicate to uh, partners and audiences outside. And that's really what gave the belief and the, um, uh, the belief that Ukraine could stand and Ukrainians could fight this. So I think, you know, we were in touch with our team every single day. And the fact, you know, that we we didn't know the answers. We did not know what's going to happen next. But at least the fact that, you know, that we could communicate with them, they could see our faces. You know, we could hear, you know, what their uh, key concerns were. Obviously, the safety uh, of them, their families, um, and um, really making sure that we were there to support. You know, we were very lucky to have the support of the AmChams uh, network, this family of AmChams um, across Europe. 50 AmChams in 48 countries across Europe were extremely helpful because the 5 million Ukrainians left the country they uh the war started the russians were coming in the russians tried to uh encircle uh kiev and it's um really uh you know the the support we had from amcham so the closest amcham office we have is just across the border in uh, western ukraine in um, slovakia uh and amcham slovakia said you know you have the office feel free to use it so we also had bases we had people working in the underground shelters. And then um, whenever uh, those people who are in the underground shelters, if, if they were unable to work for a time, we had those people that had actually moved across the border. So we had this uh, continuity, this business uh, continuity, and really inspiring uh, one another. So, um, you know, we, we see uh, stories um, when um, the Russians were coming from the north, we have uh, Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola plant. It's one of the biggest Coca-Cola manufacturing facilities in Europe. And um, as the Russians came, the, 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 the plant was already, it was evacuated. The Russians came and on the map, you can actually see as the Russians were invading, they tried to come to Kiev, but they stopped at just outside Kiev and they stopped literally at the uh, Coca-Cola plant. And then we sort of try and try understand why. Why didn't they go any further? And the stories we hear is they came into the Coca-Cola plants, they, they took over the plants, and Coca-Cola also have an agreement with uh, Brown, Brown Foreman uh, for the warehouse. So they had the, the warehouse, and the Russians came in, they opened up the doors to the warehouse, and they it was full of Jack Daniels whiskey, bourbon. And they did not go any further. And this was uh, even speaking to some military strategists. We had General Petraeus here in Kiev dinner a few months ago. And e even issues like that. It's, um, it was uh, an interesting story of, of real um, US uh, support in terms of stopping uh, the Russian advance. Um, maybe slightly, we look at that tongue in cheek today, but it's just so much that was, um, you know, how do you uh, stop? And how do you support uh, the army that, that is fighting for, for freedom, for liberty, for, for independence? And I think it's um, there are tough decisions. So any leader has to really make tough decisions. And a decision-making process is every morning you wake up and one leader, each leader has to ask herself, himself, what is the right thing to do? What decision I make that, how, it, what is the right thing to do? Um, these um, moral issues, these ethical issues. And it's always thinking, how will history 
judge me? How will history judge us in terms of the decision we make today? And the, there are big decisions to make. You know, sometimes it is about life or death. And um, that's why, you know, the leaders we see today are, are truly uh, phenomenal, inspirational. And we see um, many uh, different changes in, in leadership. So uh, if we had, you know, maybe 10 years ago, it was more of an expat community. We still have that. But today we see more and more women leadership. So the CEOs of companies like, like McDonald's, like MasterCard, like Visa, like Pfizer, like uh, Coca-Cola and uh, Boeing, many, many others, they are today all led by women leadership. And we see women leadership as a real uh, driver, uh, especially when the men, those that are aged between uh, 18 to 60, they aren't allowed to leave the country. So unless they have a special permission um, for either business trips, uh, which we also help our members with. But it's really the women leadership, but it's also um, the, the male leadership. And one of the things we also work with very closely now, both with the Ministry of Economic Development is with the Ministry of Defence, how do we keep the economy continuing to operate? Because it's really those that are creating uh, jobs, creating wealth, paying taxes, really during the, this uh, full scale war, which is so important. And then how do we continue to support those? So um, men aged between um, 25 and 60 are uh, conscripted. There is a uh, clear conscription uh, policy. So there are seven boxes. If a company can tick three of those seven boxes, it can what's called reserve up to 50% of its male uh, staff. And that's also we work closely with the Ministry of Economic Development with our members, making sure we have the transparency and the clarity in terms of this. Because you speak to the leaders, you speak to general managers, and sometimes these are the most difficult decisions they have to make. So it's 50%. So you have to decide to keep your factory running or to keep the organization running, you know, which 50% are really the critical uh, male staff that uh, you need to keep going. Um, but then again, it's the other 50% that you may not be able to reserve. And um, it's really if they then are called up to uh, the, the, the army, it's really how do we support them? And we've seen phenomenal acts of benevolence. We've had uh, university studies by the University of Cambridge. It's this acts of benevolence it's supporting. We've seen the volunteer movement. There have been volunteer organ organizations that have come up that actually support the um, employees, support the, uh, the army, the soldiers. So we have our own employees serving in the armed uh, forces and making sure that um, he has everything that he needs. So we all contributed and we bought a a, a, a four by four uh, second hand vehicle for for him to have, uh, which he needs during his um, service. Uh, and it's making sure all the kits and financially, uh, financially supporting um, our employees and the companies do to do, do continue to to do that. So it is really that number one issue. What is the right thing to do? And I think that's um, um, something that we see uh, every day the, the leaders have to uh, ask themselves. Um, uh, so in terms of continuing, yes, you know, Kiev today, it's, um, it, it's a vibrant city. You know, the restaurants are open, the, the business continues. Uh, we do have um, regular air sirens. So the last one we had like last night, uh, we have both drones, um, Iranian drones that are flying over, that are dropping uh, explosives. We have ballistic missiles flying in. We have cruise missiles. So it's really understanding the safety procedures. So whenever there is an air raid siren, it's making sure that, you know, one day, hopefully we invite you to Kiev to see our office. We have a, a beautiful view of, of, of Kiev. We are on top of a hill. 
the 15th floor of, of the of an office center. But because there is so much glass here, we make sure that as soon as an air raid siren, we go down into the, the, the basement, into the shelter and secure it. Sa safety of employees is, is our number one um, concern. And um, it's really in terms of in leadership, it's the empathy. It's really understanding what that person uh, is going through, because sometimes you call one of your employees and she or he, you know, they can't answer the phone. Um, it's understanding really living through this, the empathy, trying to see, you know, what the other people are, are going through and, and it's supporting. So as we were preparing for the, the, the start back in before the, the full scale war started, we paid out uh, salaries in advance. We gave additional financial compensation and we had a free to go policy. We have we said anybody who wants to leave when the borders were open could leave uh, out of 40 staff. Only one person left. So and today, 40 uh, out of our 40 employees, 38 are back in the country. They're back here serving. Um, and, you know, our staff and, for example, our business development director, Natalia, she was seven months pregnant when the, the full scale war started and it was supporting her. She gave birth to twins uh, in um, in Hungary. She crossed the border. Uh, Amcham Hungary again, very much we got support. She gave birth to twins. She's come back. She's given birth since to a third child. And that just shows the belief, the belief in the future of the country, of the people, the families, bringing up their families here and the belief of business. Because, you know, we are um, looking now towards, you know, what happens in terms of when the war uh, is, is, is over. And this will be Ukraine is uh, on track to join the, the European Union, uh, and this will be a vibrant economy where uh, and the miss the, you know the message that we are delivering is that uh, Ukraine is open for business. And how do we do that? The, the ambassadors, the companies that continue to operate in Ukraine, they are the best ambassadors Ukraine have because they are here, businesses here. And for those that aren't in Ukraine at the moment, the message we deliver is that it's risky to invest in Ukraine, but it's more risky not to invest in Ukraine. And these opportunities that we see uh, across different sectors, what's Key sectors we see, um, so Ukraine, obviously, it's a key agricultural power uh, powerhouse. Um, and we see uh, the full um, uh, the full cycle. So we have tomorrow we're visiting a company that makes corn seeds, a big American company called Teva. Then we have the corn, so you have the seeds, uh, you have the um, uh, crop protection, you have the machinery, the John Deere is the case, then you have the farmers, then you have uh, the um, uh, logistics, so the railways, the ports, and then you have the big A, B, C, Ds, the a ADM, Bungay, Cargill, Dreyfus that are continued to, to export. And that's so important. So we managed to keep this grain corridor open. The Ukraine's feeding the world in terms of the, the agriculture. And um, again, it, the insurance, how the insurance policies um, uh, are, are set up. But sectors that we see uh, a lot of interest almost every day. I'm meeting with companies now that are working in a sector. It's a brand new committee we have. So we have 24 uh, committees. And our newest committee is uh, defense and security. So there are so many now uh, companies coming in terms of defense and um, security. So it's really understanding also, you know, the opportunities for business, the companies that, that are uh, coming here. Um, it's supporting. So, you know, we are here to serve. We are here to serve um, our, our members. Um, I've been in Ukraine since 1996 was the first time I came. And I think what I've seen is this unity, this phenomenal unity, this coming together, uh, everyone all coming together. And I think that's been one of the key reasons why Ukraine stands. It's when people are united and united 
uh, internally united with the world. The communications that have come from um, the, the leadership of the country, but also leadership of business and um, all, all, all coming together. So um, I could go on and on and on. I have many stories to tell, but um, I'll probably just uh, pause there and I'll, I'll hand over because we have uh, again, I think the ambassadors we have is having, you know, companies and we have three companies today here, uh, Microsoft, McDonald's and the Intercontinental. And, you know, I want them to share their stories and um, I'm here. Any questions you have, I'll be delighted to uh, answer. And again, Dan, thank you. Thank you to Amcham Taiwan for all the team. Thank you to the Amcham family. You know, we are uh, we are here. Anything we can do to help. Uh, any support, advice we can provide, please do let us know and we'll be delighted to do so. Thank you so, so much, Andy, for a very inspirational and informative start to today's uh, meeting with the American Chamber of Commerce in Ukraine. Um, we will have time for questions at the end, uh, toward the end of this session. So probably around 3.15 or so, we will open the floor to questions. Please do prepare any now that you may, may have. We're happy to share them with our uh, friends in, in Ukraine. As Andy mentioned, we have three special guests, ambassadors. Each of them are leaders in the Ukraine and regional business community. And we are delighted to begin uh, with one of those three leaders, whose name is Kristina Linichenko. And Kristina is currently the ESG and philanthropy, philanthropy manager uh, for Ukraine, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia at McDonald's. Uh, Christina has been in the food industry for over 20 years. She was a, an employee in, in the Ministry of Agriculture in Ukraine and also went to get then a degree in international business management, adding to her role in public administration. Just three days before the war in 22, 22 uh, began, she joined McDonald's as a public affairs com uh, consultant and six months later had become the acting head of communications in McDonald's in Ukraine. And Christina's role has been a very important one in McDonald's road to not only recovery, but to strength, as I'm sure she'll talk about. Andy just referenced the 60 million plus customers that have been served just in the first nine months of 2024. This symbolizes the incredible recovery and resilience of the McDonald's presence in Ukraine. Um, since 2023, Christine has been working toward promoting new legislation that's beneficial to organizational operations in all three countries, uh, the Czech Republic, Ukraine, and Slovakia, and she uh, works closely with government officials to promote McDonald's values and to share the impact that the company is having on the community, the positive impact. And Christina is also responsible for implementing sustainable strategy and ESG reporting. Christina, we're delighted to have you with us. Welcome. Hello, good morning, uh, who is in Kiev, and uh, hello, everyone. So, um, First of all, I would like to share some information about McDonald's, who we are in Ukraine at the moment. So it's about 10,000 uh, employees. We have opened 104 restaurants and also we have additionally 15 restaurants that are currently closed. Uh, why they are closed? Because uh, during opening process, we analyzed everything that we need to calculate and everything that will impact our activity. So that's why we uh, thought how we can uh, be sure that our people will be in the safe place. And uh, we also calculated times that they need to go to the shelter because it depends on the missile attack, what actually flying to Ukraine. So that's why we understand how many minutes we need to close our restaurant, uh, say every customer goodbye and uh, go to the shelter. Uh, so at the beginning of, uh, of after our opening, uh, it took us about 15 minutes to close the restaurant, to do everything, to prepare for the closing. Uh, 
to switch off all the devices and uh, then go to shelter. Now it's about five minutes. Of course, our customers wanted to stay even if the air siren and uh, sometimes we need to call police because we're explaining that it's dangerous for you, but people don't want to leave our restaurants and want to stay. After opening, opening after air sirens and uh, some attacks uh, took us um, about 40 minutes at the beginning. Now it's 15 minutes and we are open and again serving our uh, dishes. So uh, it was three stages uh, during the war where uh, how we how we operate. So the first one it was uh, preparation. Of course, we read a lot of uh, news that the war is beginning and uh, soon will be um, some Soon will be a bad situation in Ukraine, so that's why we started to prepare some scenario. Uh, we, of course, scenario is ready on the paper, but when we see in practice, it was something else. And we understand that the first is people. And now we still thinking that people, our people, our customers, our employees, it's the first stage. So that's why we need to care about them. Uh, after, uh, after first, hours uh, after uh, invasion we decided to close our restaurants and uh, uh, people take care about them about their families and uh, after a few days i think we saw that a lot of people started to volunteer and that's why we decided okay we can food we have food we know how to work with this so that's why let's do something on this area and uh, help people to understand how they can be um how they can support the country so we started our volunteer company with food kits for different regions we covered about all regions of ukraine even um, not far from uh, uh, zero zero line from the war and uh, it was about 320,000 uh, food kits that we distributed to different families uh, in difficult times so the second time, uh, the second round, it was the opening. How to calculate where we can open, what we can open, how to prepare all the security protocols, how to understand uh, what people actually can do. And uh, we started to analyze all our restaurants and shelters near restaurants. And uh, when we saw that some restaurants not not so close to the shelters, we also started to build it. And we have a few of them in Kyiv region and Jatomi region. Um, it's actually like Hobbit house. We called it Hobbit house, but it was really nice shelter for our crew and customers who uh, who uh, in our restaurants at the uh, when when the siren. Uh, air siren begins and uh, after our opening and a uh, few days it was like uh, when all people applause when we opened restaurants they stayed uh, near restaurants after air siren they applause to our crew uh, and we had a great support uh, of our business here in ukraine we have biggest queer from the beginning i think it's what 27 years ago something like this but uh, we saw that, of course, security is the most important. And we try to explain our customers as well that please don't stay near a restaurant. You need to go to the shelter. You will be you will receive your uh, dishes and uh, you will get your burger. And uh, actually, during uh, uh, after after opening and uh, during our current work, we faced with uh, uh, blackouts. And uh, during these blackouts, of course, we, we continued to work. We uh, built some system how to inform our customers that currently this restaurant is closed. You can visit another one. And also uh, our team, our employees, they don't want to use this uh, time just to sitting in shelter. So they decided to build other business processes. They uh, calculated what they need to um, order on our suppliers. 
they uh, started to review some processes. They even have some learning processes in these shelters. And it was really a resilience of our team. And we understand that if we have such team, such employees, so we will be in the safe place and we need to protect these people in any case. So from the very beginning and uh, Till the opening, we continue to pay a uh, salary to all employees. And uh, now we continue to pay salaries to our mobilized uh, people. Unfortunately, it's about 5% of our staff uh, on the bar. And uh, we unfortunately, uh, 13 of them, uh, they died and uh, 65 back already to work. So that's why we uh, work with them, how to support them uh, after um, after getting again to the work and how to uh, explain what processes uh, we already have, what we can do for them. Uh, so explain our team how to work with uh, these people because we understand, you know, McDonald's is so fast. And we understand that for some people, because of mental health that we have now in Ukraine, uh, we understand that we need to support them. Because in any case, it doesn't depend what was at night, but our crew at the morning started to serve and to uh, cook the best burgers in Ukraine. And uh, uh, also uh, during this, um, during this, period of uh, full-scale invasion, we received, it was the first time from McDonald's uh, in the world, we received a certification of a best burger. So it was online uh, certification that was actually specially provided for Ukraine, for uh, McDonald's, in, and we received it. So it's new recipe for uh, burgers, and uh, we have this international certification uh, completed. So. I'm very happy to answer your questions because actually uh, when I prepared uh, for the meeting, I tried to um, write some some very impacted things that we have, but it's a lot of things. So that's why I can explain and talk for for hours uh, about our resilience because it's really it's really impressive. Thanks. Christina, thank you so, so much. Uh, what an incredible story. McDonald's, of course, is familiar to all of us here in Taiwan, uh, and um, we can picture the situation you're describing, and uh, it, it just is such a compelling thing to talk about the need to even add or build shelters, not only for your customers, but for your crew. And both the losses and the uh, incredible successes that you've had. Um, if I could, I know your time is limited. You'll be leaving it uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, so we want to say a special thanks for that, uh, for joining us during the time you do have. Could you talk just briefly a little bit about what support you've received from headquarters or your regional operations and how that support has made a difference in the ability to continue operating as you have? So I think the main support from our headquarters is uh, leaving the Russian and uh, the uh, other other things. So they understood that we need to pay a uh, salary to our crew and uh, to our employees and we receive great amount of money, of course, to support uh, this. Uh, also, during uh, blackouts, we understand that we need to have the shelters. Uh, not shelter, sorry, generators to support uh, electricity. And also we receive this money. So it's almost financial support. And of course, uh, the main thing is leaving Russia uh, during few months after invasion. I think it's a great result for, for, the, whole, for the whole company. you uh, remind us again how many restaurants you have today in, in Ukraine and, and whether you've continued opening new ones during the war? Yeah, so we have 119 uh, restaurants and uh, it's operated only 104. But uh, for example, for this year, we already opened about 10, 9 or 10 restaurants. I need to check. And we also have plans till the end of the year. 
and uh, we are opening in different uh, regions and um, I know that and you like this uh, information that we currently we are closed only in few in two regions where is the most safety in Ukraine at the moment but we have plans for them <laughs> I want to uh, mention that in addition to the group here on Teams, we have an even larger audience watching live on YouTube. We do have the ability to ask questions either in our chat section or on the Slido link uh, that was just provided in the chat. We welcome questions uh, and uh, would be glad to pose them as we go along for the remainder of the session. Um, Christina, the um, the the early days going back to the, the the February period in 2022. Did you have any difficulty managing stock? Had you done anything to ensure that your provisions, that your supplies would be adequate to get you through that initial most difficult period uh, in, the, in the beginning of the invasion? Yeah, so uh, one of our values is uh, family and uh, the family is our franchisees. We don't have it in Ukraine, but uh, we have them uh, in different countries. Uh, the second one is our suppliers and also we and uh, our employees. So when we started to our preparation for possible things, of course, we started to communicate with them as well. And we ask them, are they ready? What they think to do? How they will support us if? And uh, the list of different scenarios. And also the same was, for example, during blackouts, when um, our supplier already uh, distributed uh, food to our restaurants, when we see that, okay, this one is closed and we are uh, without uh, light, uh, without electricity for more than 10 hours, but our uh, refugi uh, refrigerators can take about 12 hours. So we called him and this supplier, not only delivery, but took these products and uh, delivered to other restaurants. So we had this support from them and actually uh, Ukraine, one of the uh, countries who don't have any waste, food waste. Even during these uh, blackouts, we understand how we need to cook this food, not to, uh, not, not to have the waste from the cooking. So it was calculated ideally with a great team. Uh, and I think the main support, what actually you ask, it's about um, CFT creation. So McDonald's is like project management. We have different procedures. We have great procedures. And uh, before the war, ordering of some new products took us about six months. So we need to build this uh, uh, way how, how to order. During uh, the war, uh, it took us about three, three weeks. So we understand that we can go quicker and we can go with different procedures uh, that uh, uh, approved and uh, because they need uh, at this time here. So between you and the regional organization of McDonald's, you've managed to not only sustain and, and continue to grow, but even accelerate many of your procedures and your operations, which is incredibly impressive as well. Just maybe one more question in this short time we know you have remaining with us. Uh, when, you, when you have a, as many employees as you do in Ukraine uh, and you think about the careful attention you gave to their needs, to their safety, um, what, what are some of the lessons learned about how you can assist such a large group of employees in bearing with such incredible difficulty, uh, what are what are some pointers you might give to anybody who's facing a crisis of any kind and serving the needs of your employees and, and knowing that they're, you're watching out for them? So at the first stage, we uh, saw that some people decided to leave Ukraine because, um, because of safety. And uh, that's why we uh, communicate with our um, uh, colleagues from other countries. Uh, we propose to have this additional employees because actually the kitchen is the same in all countries. So McDonald's has the same procedures. That's why it's easier for our employees to work in any country. 
and even better because McDonald's in Ukraine is the best one. Uh, sorry, sorry, guys, <laughs> but I received some comments. And uh, during this term, so they had the opportunity to work in other country. It was the first stage. When we started to open, we communicate with all our employees that actually, guys, we will start opening these few restaurants in this region. Are you ready to move from, for example, from Kharkov to Kiev? to start uh, your new uh, new uh, term of your life in Kyiv, but working in the same uh, conditions. And uh, a lot of people decided to move abroad or still uh, be in Ukraine, but in other region. And uh, this is the way how we managed uh, how to support and work with our with our people. And for example, I'm responsible for Ukraine, uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia. And now in Czech Republic and Slovakia, about 10 percent of employees is Ukrainians. Mm. Oh. So an important lesson from McDonald's experience in Ukraine is that employees will have different personal needs, different desires when such a crisis hits. And it sounds like McDonald's went to incredible lengths to ensure that people could be in a new place, move if they needed to, and still maintain their role or their, or their engagement as an employee of the McDonald's Corporation, whether that's inside Ukraine or outside Ukraine. Mm -hmm. That's a very special and I'm sure a uh, very complicated thing to manage. Yeah, but it was done individually and we actually know from almost all stories from our employees because we uh, tried to manage it to understand to talk with uh, every person uh, they need so their expectations the term that they decided do they want to uh, go back to ukraine again and or they want just to leave uh, while the war is continuing so all all the stages we try to build and i think it's successful because currently all our employees in ukraine so all employees from mcdonald's ukraine in ukraine phenomenal achievement and christina we know your time is tight today we want to say a thank you to you for for an incredible sharing with our amcham taiwan community uh, and uh, we wish you and the entire mcdonald's family in ukraine continued safety and success Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice we'll day. now turn. Thank you too. Thank you. We'll now turn to our next uh, ambassador uh, from uh, the Ukraine business community. Uh, this is another leader in a different industry. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us uh, Artem Prikodko. Artem is the general manager of the Intercontinental Hotel in Kyiv, a premier hotel. As Andy pointed out, it has not shut down for a single night uh, since the war started. Um, Artem has 13 years of experience in the hotel industry, starting in sales and marketing, climbing the ladder to become general manager. He has been working in a variety of sectors, including uh, airlines, automotive, customer service, operational management, and his role as general manager requires him to continue to drive operational efficiency, but also deliver safe and exceptional guest experiences in an incredibly challenging environment. And he's a very passionate leader, and I think an outspoken uh, champion for uh, his, his company and the work that he and others are doing to maintain incredible resilience in Ukraine. So Artem, welcome, thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, great introduction. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, as mentioned, uh, uh, preparation was key. Uh, we knew, we expected, we didn't realize it's going to happen, to be honest, until last last uh, minute, but we were ready. We created strategic reserves of food, of drinking water, of water for operations, diesel for the generators. Uh, still, still the war did hit us surprisingly. Also, we were all prepared and this was the key moment where you show your leadership, where you stand solid and people can look at you. The Intercontinental Kiev is the largest international five-star property in Kiev. It has 270 rooms, uh, many meeting rooms, and after the first days of, uh, let's say, slightly 
um, active movement on the 24th and 25th, we uh, ended up being full, totally full uh, with guests. Uh, we became the main residence for all big international media. We, uh, I decided at the uh, beginning of the war when it started, uh, my first message to all my employees and colleagues was stay safe where you are because the most uh, dangerous was the way to the hotel or from the hotel and in the hotel we have a great shelter uh, it's it's been upgraded now to many many levels and we can go into detail afterwards uh, so the people who were at home i asked them to stay at home uh, me myself i went to the hotel my wife was meanwhile in the hospital with my newborn son three days old so everybody was safe and this was the key uh, getting to the hotel uh, we added some rooms for the employees we uh, asked them to bring their kids and parents so we've built a huge community within the intercontinental to build this tower of strength as we call it uh, for the coming days we blocked all entrances we created new procedures of controlling of monitoring guests, of monitoring incoming reservations, because there were some uh, doubtful reservations coming in. So it was a lot about security and safety. Uh, we were safe with all our supplies. However, uh, we wanted to maintain the five star luxury level and we managed to uh, bring in fresh fruits, fresh vegetables from all our partners. Many of them left Ukraine but uh, they communicated to their staff to open the storages for us and, and we found drivers on the 25th and 26th and 27th of february and literally i took out cash money from the operations i gave these two drivers which i never knew before which were recommended somehow but still you give the money to them they went and they brought us the products it's it's amazing and the coming days we took care more of uh, our guests and our people because uh, medicine questions came up uh, insulin questions came up so these are things which we now have on strategic reserves now we were focusing on food and diesel now these are also key important things so as i mentioned leadership is uh, immensely important because there was a moment of panic in the hotel on the 24th nobody knew really what's going on we heard sirens we heard explosions we didn't really knew what does the siren mean because uh, there was no script uh, how many times it sounds what does it mean so first thing was safety safety get down to the shelter keep safe our shelter is very deep underneath the earth it's 13 meters below level we have uh, restrooms there we created lounge zones we created sleeping areas so we spend a lot of time in the shelter all together uh, just being safe uh, on the coming days of 25th 26th there was a lot of communication going between the head office intercontinental hotels group and the ownership of the intercontinental which is a local uh, entrepreneur to decide what to do next and having all the scripts of risk assessment and what to do in critical situations definitely it was adapted to the new reality and altogether we uh, made the decision and it was as we now understand the totally right decision to maintain the operations uh, focusing on safety focusing on safety of guests and, and uh, employees and uh, as i mentioned the chaos in the first days uh, teached me to be a really um, directive and strong leader uh, my previous approach was always to uh, share my vision to guide the people towards a result to to find a way in these days you have to be strict you have to be directive set clear goals set clear frames set clear clear structure and people will follow you they will see uh, that they can trust you because nobody knew what's going to happen and honest open communication to your employees and to your guests is key it was really key because even if you don't know and you don't know you have to say it out loud this is the situation as it is these are the steps which are we going through 
to ensure certain steps and follow new scripts of security and uh, safety. Um, yeah, uh, this led us that we kept strong for over 40 days, which were the, the most critical ones, which I looking back uh, for, for, for the hotel and maybe also for Kiev. And we were lucky to welcome the first large international delegation already in May. And it was uh, Mr. Bundeskanzler, Mr. Scholz. It was President Macron and it was the Prime Minister of Italy at that time, uh, Mr. Draghi, and the President of Romania. So um, I have never seen since that day such a large amount of security and I mean heavily armored security, but we made it. We made it. We proved that uh, we are a safe sport. We are operational we proved operational excellence because not a single day we had interruptions in water supply because we were creative. We have a large tank of water supply for the hotel. And once the water was cut off, we had trucks coming in to deliver the water to maintain uh, all the needed showers and, and kitchen operations. The same for diesel. And we were very creative in many uh, small details. And yes, this gained trust, this gained the reputation of the Intercon as the real strength, and we remained fully occupied for the first, I believe, six months. Huh? So it was it was uh, the main spot for all the guests and, uh, and uh, furthermore, then employees coming back. Talking about employees, unfortunately, first wave of employees left us because they were concerned about security and fully understandable. Uh, the same uh, way uh, as uh, previously mentioned, we found them uh, employment at different properties. Till today, I receive calls from general managers all around the world thanking for the high quality people uh, uh, who are employed now. We had even a very uh, interesting case, a deaf couple um, who were working at the housekeeping department. They cannot hear and cannot talk and they could not hear the sirens and there were no applications about the sirens so they only saw people running around but they didn't realize that it's danger so after uh, one and a half weeks we together with our uh, big uh, partners uh, big international media i don't know if i can mention this at that point i have to ask for permission we organized the transportation from Kiev with armored vehicles to Poland, from Poland to Germany, and immediate employment at the Holiday Inn in Frankfurt with a uh, deaf uh, partner who guided them, who translated them, and, and built up the communication. And it, till today, it's one of our, of our, our greatest cases. In general, around 50 people left. We have still people fighting, uh, around 15 employees are in action, we fully support them 100% with salaries from the first days of war. Unfortunately, as many of uh, ACC members, we lost two colleagues, the both were lost in action and uh, it's a big shame, and, uh, but this is the reality of war. Huh? It's, uh, it's, it's about death, unfortunately, in many, in many things. So, but we continue to support everyone to buy equipment and uh, additional additional things for their for their duty, and we are endlessly thankful for their duty because thanks to all the Ukrainian soldiers and the Ukrainian army, we are able to continue our life. We are able to continue our operations. We are able to live in a, as and you already mentioned, in a really vibrant city, and. Um, it's, it's a new reality, it's difficult to understand for someone who's uh, away and once people come to Kiev, they see the, this new reality, they realize that it's possible to, to live and, and to enjoy actually life, despite all the uh, air raids, all the shahids and the rockets coming in. Uh, today we had 136 shahids coming in uh, to Ukraine with air alerts and with explosions. Fortunately, as far as I understand, nobody was uh, injured, uh, but it's it's the new reality. So I would maybe also rather prefer to ask some questions. I gave a brief overview uh, 
and, and, and insights. And when there will be questions coming up, I will be really happy to answer them. Artem, thank you. That's an absolutely remarkable recounting of both events and the critical importance of a top hotel remaining open during crisis. All of us have seen the images of democratic leaders visiting Kyiv and, and, and Ukraine at different points throughout the war. We probably aren't thinking about where are they staying at night and what has to go on to make that work the way it does. And, and now we know. I think we're also hearing about the remarkable attention and personal attention given to employees and the sincere level of care for employee welfare. If you could hold with us for the next 15 minutes as we go through our next speaker, we'll then open the floor to questions from the community here. We do have some, uh, including some that are directed to you. So if that's okay, Artem, we'll move to Leonid first. Absolutely. Thank you. All Thank right, you. so I'm very, very pleased to introduce our third and final uh, ambassador from Ukraine's business community. Uh, Leonid Polupan. Leonid is the director of Microsoft Ukraine and the country manager of Microsoft in Ukraine and the Baltics. Leonid has been in this role uh, since July of 2023, was previously country manager for Microsoft in Ukraine as of November 2022. He is focused on AI, the cloud, digital infrastructure, cybersecurity, many of the things that are highly familiar to all of us here in Taiwan as well. He's been in enterprise sales for 15 years and has led Microsoft operations in 24 different markets throughout Central and Eastern Europe. He has also worked at uh, Venbest Group and at Vodafone, and Leonid has overseen, since the war began, he's overseen uh, Microsoft's 500 million dollar commitment to support Ukraine and through that demonstrated his belief in the power of technology to continue driving progress during times of crisis. I'm sure this will be yet another message that resonates with all of us here in Taiwan. Leonid, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for the kind words and a great intro. Uh, hope you can hear me well and see me well. I have a, I have a very challenging uh, task today to share with you something that we normally share. And, and these days I share a lot across the Europe with different uh, governments. Our learnings from Ukraine normally takes a couple of days, but now I will try to squeeze everything and give you some highlights in a couple of minutes. So I would love to start with with one thing, right? And and then you will understand why why I go this way. First of all, I would like to 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 remind or maybe open to some of us uh, the fact that this war in Ukraine is probably the first in the human history that we observe in a three dimensions, right? So previously we were talking about conventional war. That's we all know we were talking about propaganda, so war in media. But now we are talking about the third dimension, which becoming extremely critical, and this is dimension of cybersecurity, right? And why why it's so important? Because as Microsoft, we 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 are these days the biggest, the largest security vendor in the world. And every day we see trillions of signals, cybersecurity signals around the world, and we analyze them and, and, and try to make conclusions and try to bring new features, new patches to, to make our world more secure. Why I'm sharing all of this? Because the fact is that the first strike on Ukraine was cyber. It was not a conventional strike. It was a cyber attack. Everything started from cyber attack. And if you think about this, then cyber security becoming the crucial topic for each and every company. Doesn't matter if you're big, if you're large, if you are enterprise level of the company, cyber security is the core. And moreover, I have to admit that uh, in Microsoft, we were observing very interesting pattern 
interesting. Of course, it's super bad, but still interesting, right? So we saw cyber attacks on some critical infrastructure, and the next day or in a couple of hours, we saw kinetical attack to these data centers, right? So if enemy cannot do it one way, they will use another type of weapon. So cyber attacks becoming a real thing, a real weapon. Uh, and, and I can give, believe me, I have a lot of uh, information, a lot of examples, like with the facts, with the dates, what kind of uh, what kind of attacks were, and so on. That's why the first response that Microsoft, we as a Microsoft, did was uh, connection with Ukrainian governments, connection with Ukrainian security services, connection with Ukrainian critical infrastructure, proactive connection, I would say, because even and it has happened a uh, few months before the full scale invasion started. We just shared our learnings. We just shared our observations and we just shared, look, if you are ready, we are ready to help you to support and so on. And this collaboration started, as I said, months before the, 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 the ground invasion started. And with this collaboration, we managed to evacuate a lot of government uh, a lot of critical infrastructure data into the cloud. As Andy rightly mentioned, that's something we just we just realized recently, right? So ground soil is not any longer the safest place for critical infrastructure. The safest place is cloud. Therefore, when the invasion started, we saw and, and we heard a lot today about how was that and, and believe me, it was a pure chaos everywhere, like streets are blocked, roads are blocked and so on. But with all of this critical infrastructure and the country continue to operate, right? So you can imagine what would happen in case if cyber attacks were successful. And for example, in all this chaos, you could not use your mobile phone you cannot use your connection. You cannot withdraw the cash. You cannot pay in the supermarket. You cannot and, and, and go on and go on, right? So the, the country would collapse. Therefore, this first engagement was extremely crucial. And I'm super happy that other big tech followed our way and continue uh, and offer their support to the country. So in the end of the day, uh, all critical infrastructure of the state, all critical infrastructure of uh, um, uh, critical enterprises of financial sector were in the cloud and they supported the state and that helped Ukraine to continue being operational. Uh, some people ask me sometimes, yes, but this is mostly uh, about the, the, the Ukraine. It's mostly about defense. It's mostly about some other critical uh, companies. This is important for them. I have some statistics though, and this also from, from our reports, that for example, during the July, from July 2020 to July 21, the pattern of cybersecurity attacks was 46% against United States, 9% against UK, for example, and 19% against Ukraine. So it was very obvious already at that time that it's unusual, right? That the country of this economy, of this side, has so much attention from cyber criminals. At the same time, uh, another interesting statistic says now, during the war, when we understand the importance of cybersecurity, when we understand the real threat of uh, cyber uh, attacks, we see only 48% of attacks against Ukraine, 36% of attacks against NATO members, 4% against other Europe countries, and so on and so forth. Meaning that in order to uh, get some success. Ukraine is not only uh, attacked uh, uh, organization, like if, if I may use this word. So they are attacking our alliances around the world. They are trying to get as much information as possible. So it's very important to understand this and to be prepared, which means that if you don't have war, immediate war, luckily on your territory, it doesn't mean 
that you are not interesting for for cyber criminals for 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 people who want to do something bad Another argument I quite often hear from the businesses, as you can imagine, we talk to many businesses, large, small, enterprise size. What they say, yes, but, but we are not defense. We are not critical infrastructure. And I have to say that 27% of attacks we see these days against government, 21% is cyber attacks on think tanks, NGOs, and others, 11% on education, only 6% against defense industry, 3% energy, 2% health, 2% transportation, and so on and so forth. Meaning that it doesn't matter if you are in defense or not, you are still target for cyber criminals. Therefore, my big learnings, uh, 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 my big learning from from this situation and my big message to everyone take care about your cyber security posture right because this is a real thing this can you you can have the best plan the best uh, um, the best uh, you know disaster response plans whatever but if your operations blocked any plan doesn't work if you build a great plan for your organization, but everything around you is not operating, you don't have a public transportation, you don't have calls, you don't have internet and so on and so forth, so it doesn't help. Meaning that really take care about this one. Uh, talking about our immediate response, so we started with, as I said, with, with cybersecurity support. Obviously, as the company, we started to think about our employees and we activated crisis management team at least six months before the invasion and um, two, three weeks before uh, all our employees were relocated to the safest place from Kyiv and they were working remotely. And uh, uh, also we supported their families, so not only immediate employees, because we understand that having uh, 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 only employee doesn't doesn't work because they all have families, they all have relatives. So we were we were supporting the whole families. When the invasion started, of course, we supported relocation of those who decided or who could uh, leave the country. So we, we supported them as well. One important thing being a, a, a global company that helped us a lot. So we activated international team, right? So team all around the world were supporting Ukraine because, for example, in the first days when many uh, connect, we, we had huge connectivity issues, we had huge life uh, threats. Uh, to employees, they could not be fully operational. So multiple things were done by our colleagues worldwide, and that helped a lot. We activated all our disaster response team, and we have many of them. Some of them are very well known uh, because they work with cybersecurity, but also it is a crisis management team. We activated our Microsoft disaster response team that supports not our employees, or our company, but any company in Ukraine. And for example, our Microsoft disaster response team, and I, I'm sharing you statistic of the last uh, calendar year, because we, we uh, publicly uh, discussed that a year ago, uh, activated and successfully finished more than 20, mi two, two, sorry, 200 missions. So this is the biggest mobilization in our history. So, and this is support to any kind of companies from healthcare, from energy, from, I don't know, education, anything, right? So, and, and, and that was, and we used, and this is also the big learning, we used proactive approach. Why proactive approach? Because in the situation of crisis, many companies, many businesses, they, they don't realize what can help them right they are in a survival mode if you will right and when you come and say hey look that's what we can do for you that can help you here and there 
then people say, oh, thank you. We didn't even think about it, right? So we used proactive support in order to, to, to help them. And our support, and uh, you mentioned that, as of December last year, our support in to, to Ukraine uh, was more than $560 million, and we are continuing these days as well, so we never stopped. And we were supporting uh, industry, uh, uh, industry, different industry domain, manufacturing, retail, FSI, agri, government, smart cities, defense, oil and gas, and so on. Why it's important? Because I think that's another big learning for me personally, and, and, and I believe should be the learning for the whole society. When you think about the critical infrastructure, normally you think, okay, critical infrastructure is defense. Now it's obvious, critical infrastructure is energy. Uh, obviously, transportation, obviously, communication. But look at Ukraine. When defense and critical, traditional, I would say, critical infrastructure became a target for the for the Russia, our retail chain became the critical infrastructure because our retailers were helping society to have food. They were given food. And you heard the story from Intercontinental. They were supporting McDonald's who were sharing people. They became a critical infrastructure. If you think of logistics, right? So our postal services became a logistical change. You know, this is amazing how the shift happens immediately. And that's why we were focusing on every industry and we're supporting every industry. And uh, one more important thing, and, and, and I will pause maybe for, for any questions, because as I said, normally it takes days, like layer by layer to discuss those things. So it is important to think, uh, to think about asymmetric answers, right? So if you think of what Ukrainians do, Ukrainians do these days. So it's not immediately direct response. So we work through innovation. I used to say when I talk to my leadership team, when I talk to my corp, I used to use the wording. It's not official that look, these days we shape the future of the world in Ukraine because things we do here become a new normal, right? So what we do, the only way for us to become successful to resist is to go crazy, if you will, with innovations, right? Experiment, do things and so on. And that helps a lot. So this openness to new thing helps, right? Cybersecurity helps, innovation helps, cloud helps for sure. And maybe a few more things, I think what important uh, to, to, uh, to do also, to think what are you going to, to have a real, emergency response plan, right? What are you going to do? For example, Microsoft Office was uh, destroyed during one of the attack uh, two years ago, right? And it didn't block us from anything because we organized a hybrid work for all our employees. And our main goal for our employees is stay safe. Please stay safe. We organized and, and we didn't stop. Since 2003, when Microsoft came to Ukraine, we didn't stop even for an hour, right? So we were always continuing working. And of course, as the leader talking about the, the, the leadership, I think it's a time to adaptive leadership, right? And you heard from previous speakers as well. You need to be adaptive. And it's not necessarily about being direct or being democratic or being this or that. It's about being able to quickly shape yourself and be comfortable in uncomfortable. Because you, you don't know what you don't know. And these days we don't know many things. So you need to be ready for this and you need to be, and you need to generate energy to your team and also, uh, act with a lot of empathy because what I noticed talking to my team these days from the day one, it was all about empathy. It was less about a real work because they will do their work. They are professional. But what they want from you is to listen, to hear and to support in many other aspects. I remember sitting in the, not in Kiev, in the safer place, uh, 24 times seven supporting uh, country data, uh, evacuating country data, helping with this um, uh, uh, evacuation of the data. I had a team 
who was sitting day and night. And they said when I was coming to them and asking like, how can I help and so they didn't care about anything but taking care of their families, right? And my job in all of a sudden become to be a supporter for their families, right? To give them understanding that their family are uh, under someone's, you know, care while they do a thing that is important for them, for the state and, and for for the society. So this is in a nutshell and, and happy to take any questions if there are some. Thank you so much, Leonid. Another incredible and thought provoking uh, uh, re recounting of your experience and that of Microsoft in these these years. You've talked about the 3D nature of this war, and I think that will be something all of us here in Taiwan understand, also a frequent target of cyber attacks. Um, and you've really brought home the way that those cyber attacks are also then showing up in, in, in the kinetic physical world as well. And the link between those things is, is really profound and one that I think most of us have not thought about before. We now have, uh, for the next 10 minutes, we have uh, Leonid, Artem, and Andy with us to take questions. As a reminder, we have the Slido uh, arrangements for anyone who wishes to pose questions. A number of them have already come in. I'm going to uh, share a few of these, uh, and I'm going to begin with um, um, a question coming in from a board member. Uh, which goes to our, our most recent speaker, Leonid. Um, and he, the question is, based on your firsthand experience in 2022, what suggestions do you have for the Taiwan government or, or really any government that's facing a potential critical situation to do to enhance resilience? And in particular, how can governments coordinate most effectively with the private sector to achieve the best whole of society resilience. And I'd open this question to all of you after Leonid. Yeah, and this is a brilliant question. Just recently I had a uh, I had a meeting like obviously I'm covering also Baltic states that are very interested in this, right? Because they they, they feel the pressure, they they feel the threat, but also some uh, Scandinavian countries, I will not name them because, you know, because of the obvious reasons. And we had the same discussion. So uh, there is there, there is no a sil silver bullet. At the same time, uh, again, taking learnings from Ukraine first and the foremost. What helped us? It's access to the latest cutting edge innovation and technology. Meaning that if you think about your regulations, right? So what Ukrainian government did, they said immediately, okay, no regulation, no no any uh, barriers for cloud you do it right what has happened next we continue operating because cloud became legal let's say fully legal it, it was but but there were some restriction and now it works then a lot of as i said asymmetric responses right a lot of things happen because of innovation and innovation can happen only if you have an access to the latest and greatest technology, meaning that you need to understand in case of something, are you able to activate this technology? Do you have an access or do you have legislation that suggests you, OK, you need to go for the tender for budgeting and it will take you a few years in order to get it right? So I, I think that the paradigm of the, the uh, let's say value of the technology change so i would think about what you have what you have access to how quickly you can take this technology how quickly you can activate it how quickly you can respond so are you prepared for that this is one part and the second part of the question is uh, rethink what is critical infrastructure as i said Make sure they are prepared because, for example, at the very beginning, when we started to say, hey, dear Ukrainian government, here is the group of the customers or companies from this sector being heavily and massively attacked from cyber. 
please take this information. And the, the thing was that they didn't know what to do. They came to these companies and, and, and what? They are not prepared. But afterwards, they build the mechanism how they as the government can support any type of the customer because if they are under attack that means something right that might mean something and so on so rethinking collaboration between businesses of any kind of any industry and how you can activate those so i would say i would start with rethinking of those things and then but as i said it, it's a long discussion but but just few things that i think are critical and have a backups sorry have a backups always every day thank you Hayden. i think it's very very clear and, and extremely helpful and we can we can act on some of those things uh i'm sure through our through amcham as well um artem or andy anything you'd like to add to that we do have a few other questions that are coming in yeah i, I would just add uh, absolutely what what Lou and you've mentioned it's speed it's really you know these taking uh, decisions quickly. On the day the full-scale invasion started on the 24th, and on the 24th, the National Bank gave permission to remove uh, regulation and move to the cloud. That saved, that saved so much, and that's why where we are today. Um, but again, it's so important to have this dialogue, and I think AmCham, uh, across the world, this is this platform where we get the voice of business across to governments. So we were liaising with uh, governments on an hourly basis again. So companies were coming in saying, this is what we can do to help. You know, this is what we need. And it's just having this speed and especially at a time when uh, critical decisions have to be made. It's having people take responsibility for their, their actions. Um, but really be being able to to make a decision very, very uh, quickly. Next question, uh, maybe if, if in the interest of time, if you could think of just one thing in response to this, uh, what caught you off guard or were you most unprepared for when the invasion and war happened and started? One thing we were most unprepared or, or caught you off guard. I, I, it's a tough one. I think I, I will I will answer like very on a personal level, right? On a very personal level. So when the war started, I saw before the war started few hours before the war started because i i went to bed when when uh, when when i just didn't have more energy to work with one of the huge cyber attacks i saw all the signs but till the very end i didn't believe it's going to happen right and i didn't do i was prepared to multiple things but i didn't do few of them so i think one 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 big learning for me is be pragmatic and accept the reality, right? So doesn't matter, like accept it fast. It doesn't mean you need to agree with that, but just accept it. Well, thank you. Uh, Artem, there's a question for you. Um, do many multinational companies use the Intercontinental as a contingency location for offices, liaison offices? And if so, do you have the right level of communication satellite bandwidth to support those multinationals and, and others who are who need to use those facilities? Absolutely. We learned our lessons. We learned to be fully autonomous. We do not rely on uh, satellite communication. We have optic fiber cable connection established. We are uh, home for several companies, for top sea level uh, delegates. Mm, many reasons. We are fully autonomous in, in, in terms of water supply, energy, internet, communications. We have the shelter. We are well prepared and um, yeah, we are in very good communications with the government and with all the relative uh, institutions which are key, important now uh, for operations, for security. And this was what surprised me a lot in the first days. 
Mm, unfortunately, there was uh, a pretty chaotic movement of weapons in Kiev. And as a civil person, you don't know how to react to that because it creates fear and it's pure, nothing else than fear. So you don't know how to deal with that. And many institutions who you try to ask for support, they were not available. I mean, you must imagine it's a full scale invasion. All security services, police is involved in protecting um, the city and the city borders. So um, barely, barely were people available to support you. We saw a lot of weapons. We saw a lot of, unfortunately, uniformed uh, formations and battalions of people who we could not realize who they are because there were no clear chevrons. Are they Ukrainian military? Are they special services? You don't know. So the important uh, point here was, and what I mentioned at the beginning, to fully block the entrance, fully block the hotel, and control each and single person who is going out and in and uh, only the people you know the rest was quite uh, scary but into these details we can go on another discussion and and and, and thank you so much for sharing that artem and and it's it's a practical reality that those of us who've never been in such a situation would have great difficulty imagining so we really appreciate that you share that reality of what those first days were like and how you responded and i and i think on that note given the time constraints i want to say firstly i think basically we have a lot of questions that have come in we're going to send those questions over to you andy uh we'll do our best to work with you to provide answers this this has been a session thanks to the three of you and to our visitor from Christina from McDonald's that has exceeded all of our expectations and we want to express both our great gratitude for the time that you're taking in the midst of so much else and our tremendous admiration to all of you to your communities your companies your employees who have truly inspired all of us around the world including in Taiwan with your courage your foresight your remarkable innovation and your ability to not only do great things under duress, but share those learnings with the rest of the world. Thank you so much and our best wishes for continued safety and success to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we hope to see you in Kiev one day very soon. So uh, thank you. We'd love Thanks to make that happen, Andy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Have a, have a good Bye. day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.